it is sometimes felt that we magnify the death of Christ at the expense of his life. Now it is possible to dwell upon it in a hard mechanical way which fails to make the cross of Calvary the natural conclusion of the Father's love as well as Jesus' complete sacrificial life. Yet it is a clear fact that no other single day's doings either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, are narrated with equal fullness. Jesus' whole life, from birth to his resurrection, is not as abundantly stated in degree as to this one Friday. If it were, I read somewhere, it would fill hundreds of volumes to be as large as the entire New Testament or doubled in size. So this morning, let us examine the day that Christ died and notice the so many negatives by men that were hurled upon Jesus. Beginning with his betrayal, the three disciples sleep while Jesus prayed, but not so with Judas. He had been busy perfecting his plans as Jesus arose from his supplications and returned to his disciples, Judas entered the garden with a group of soldiers armed with weapons such as swords and clubs, as well as torches to hide their darkness. These men would not have known Jesus. There was not any aurora or a halo around his head nor was he wearing bright white garments to distinguish him from anyone else. That is Hollywood's version. So not to mistake from knowing who he is in this shadowy night. Judas said he was going to give a sign, a signal. And this new evil snake in the garden slithers straight up to Jesus and hisses, hell, rabbi, or master, and kisses him. Matthew 26, verse 49. Fear came upon this mob doing Satan's bidding at the sight of the famous Galilean prophet, and they drew back, falling to the ground. But finally, finding courage, they seized Jesus, bound him, and led him away. It was more than the hot-headed Peter could endure. And an ill-directed blow from his sword cut off the ear of a servant of the high priest. But swords, whether of friend or foe, were all alike, needless and useless. His enemies could not have availed against the powers at his command had he willed to exert them. And friends could not serve on his behalf, contrary to his set resolve to be arrested by these Jewish individuals who had total malice towards him. Divine love, the inspiring purposes of God, and the diabolical hatred an evil determination of men met head on and mingled together at Calvary and were nailed to the cross. Leaving the garden, they bring Jesus into Jerusalem for a twisted trials of the Creator by the creation. The Romans allowed the Jews, as they did all conquered peoples, a large measure of liberty so long as they kept the peace and paid the taxes they could manage their local affairs pretty much in their own cultural way but while their national council might pronounce a prisoner worthy of death the death sentence was reserved to the Roman court thus there were two distinct court trials of Jesus you had the Jewish or religious, and you had the Roman or civil. 
In each trial, there are going to be three stages set forth. In the Jewish or religious trial, the first phase was the preliminary examination before Annas, a man of advanced age and great influence. Now, Annas had been the high priest many years before and was still regarded by the Jews as high priest de jure, or Latin, which means that he was as the result of Old Testament law. Now, after a few questions, Annas sent Jesus to Caiaphas, but not before the first cruel blow had fallen upon the person of Jesus by one of the Jewish officers. The second phase was between, uh, before Caiaphas, and what this was was a very important one because Caiaphas was the son-in-law of Annas and was the high priest de facto or Latin, which means that he was the result of fact, meaning that Rome made him the leader of the Sanhedrin or the Jewish council. But listen to how this council violates its own law. Any meeting of the Sanhedrin before sunrise was illegal, but they wanted to secure the condemnation of Jesus before the people were awake, not warning the witnesses before giving evidence, failing to release Jesus when the witnesses could not agree in their testimony, and forcing Jesus to testify against himself. The ungodly prosecution was in danger of breaking down because they literally had no case. Caiaphas is determined to make Jesus criminate himself. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God, Matthew 26, verse 63. Now Jesus had been quiet before this. But to that question, he could not remain silent. Adjure means to charge or entreat solemnly under oath. Now, if Jesus denied being God's son, he would have forever been shamed as that was his claim. If he admitted being God's son in a unique way, he could be charged with blasphemy which was punishable by Jewish death. When adjured, one had to speak or bear his iniquity or guilt. Leviticus 5, verse 1. That is why cunning Caiaphas adjured our Lord. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Matthew 26, verse 64. And in Mark's parallel account in chapter 14, 62, Jesus answered, I am. Then the high priest tore his robes, saying he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blaspheme. What do you think? And they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face, and they beat him with their feast. And others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, if you are the Christ, who is it who has just hit you? Matthew 26, verse 65 to 68. Now it must have been after midnight when Jesus was arrested, but it is still was before sunrise and in the time previously before the full meeting of the Sanhedrin it was spent in brutal mockery of this unresisting prisoner the third stage before the full was before the full council was merely a formal ramification of the decision that was already reached now sometime during the earlier stages occurred the sin of Peter. Together with John, he crept back to be near Jesus and to watch the proceedings. It was perilous ground, and Peter yielding to fear as people pointed scornfully at him as being a Galilean, three times he denied his Lord, even adding oaths and cursing to the disavowals. Poor Peter, 
Yet he was not hopelessly lost. The rooster crowing. The remembrance of Jesus' prediction and his own proud boastfulness together with a sad, silent look from Jesus as the Lord crossed the court of Caiaphas' palace caused Peter to repent or to come to his senses. He went out and wept bitterly, Matthew 26, 75. There was still another story, a scene far gloomier and more terrible. Judas, too, had kept an eye on the proceedings. It might be that he hoped that Jesus would break away from his bonds and manifest his glory as Judas knew that Jesus had the power to do so. No harm would befall the master and Judas would be 30 shekels of silver richer. Not a bad day's work. When the third stage of the Jewish trial came to a close. Pilate's official sentence is all needed. Jesus had been convicted to die. Then when Judas saw that he had been condemned, Matthew 27, verse 3. Now apparently Judas didn't think Christ would be hurt. Remorse or feeling sad, bad, seized Judas. Those 30 pieces of silver are weighing too heavy on his troubled soul. Rushing to the council, he flings the money down, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, Matthew 27, verse 4. And the heartless answer, what is that to us? See to it yourself. In other words, that's your business, not ours. We don't care. We are going to execute this carpenter. A treasure, or a traitor, is always despised as a throwaway instrument by those who use him. And leaving these very wicked religious men who probably were laughing at him, he went away and hanged himself, Matthew 27, verse 5. But why didn't Judas go even then and throw himself at Jesus' feet and receive the blessing? Of forgiveness because remorse is not repentance it is just feeling sorry about the end result but it is not a changed heart Judas stands for one human reaction to betraying Jesus while Peter is the other in denying Jesus and to deny is to betray Jesus. And to betray is to deny Jesus. Both men sinned. Yet only one sought proper forgiveness. Leaving the Jewish trials, let's now examine the Roman or the civil trial. And here again, it has three stages. Before Pilate, Pilate's first question to Caiaphas and his group is, in John 18, 29, what accusation, accusation do you bring against this man? Even though they, among themselves, charge Jesus with blasphemy, they never press this as a formal charge against Jesus before Pilate because it was an insufficient reason for killing him under Roman law. So they sought to secure Pilate's sentence on vague charges of evil doing in John 18.30. And they answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Now calling Jesus an evildoer was a, not, was a lie, as the Lord never ever broke any part of the law of Moses. But having a Roman sense of justice, Pilate insists on explicit charges. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is a king, is the Christ a king. Luke 23, verse 2. So their accusation has three folds. 
perverting our nation. Now that is extremely vague. Seduction of the people through what corrupting teaching? They didn't have one. Forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. That was a lie. As Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 21, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Jesus was teaching to pay your poll tax to Rome. And Pilate would have known as his spies were out among the Jewish people in the streets of Jerusalem listening. Saying that he is the Christ, the King, which was twisted words. But they wanted Pilate to regard Jesus as a political king, which Jesus was always denying he was. But this third point got the Roman governor's attention. So Pilate summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? John 18, 33. And after his conversation with Jesus, Pilate soon satisfied himself that Jesus did not claim royalty in any dangerous political sense to Rome. So Pilate declares Jesus to be innocent of the three charges. But these religious leaders are not going to be put off. So they drum up a fourth charge, that of sedition, say, insisting he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place, which is Jerusalem, Luke 23, verse 5. Now they sought to make the largeness of the territory where Jesus operated conceal the smallness of their testimony as to what his operations were. Meaning this, that Jesus' teaching centered on the evil of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem as their corruption had spread throughout the whole nation. Now when Pilate found out that Jesus is Galilean, that he belonged to Herod's, Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at the time, Luke 23, verse 7. Now Pilate sent Jesus to Herod for two reasons. To appease Herod, to heal the few that they had likely had a problem in the past over in the matter of authority. In Luke 23, verse 12, for before they had had been an enmity between each other. You see, Herod might have thought that Pilate had overstepped his authority back in Luke chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, by mingling the blood of some Galileans, which were Herod's people, with their worship sacrifices. The second reason, to rid himself of the responsibility of making a decision concerning Jesus. He is one of Herod's subjects. Let him deal with it. This Jesus is too much of a hot potato for my career. In Luke 23, verse 8, Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time, hoping to see some sign or miracle performed by him. But Jesus acting on his own principle not to cast pearl before swine to all of Herod's questions, he did not return one word. Jesus kept quiet because to have successfully defended himself would have been to frustrate the purpose for him which he came into the world and that was to go to the cross. Now earlier in the Lord's ministry, Herod is the only man to whom Jesus spoke scornfully, and he calls him that fox in Luke 13, 32. Now another episode takes place of disrespecting God in the flesh, and Herod with his soldiers after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day. Luke 23, verse 11 and 12. So it appears that Pilate was 50% successful in fulfilling his reasons for sending Jesus to Foxy Herod. So as Jesus appears a second time before Pilate, the governor is convinced 
of Christ's innocence. Herod had examined Jesus and found no fault in him, as well as Pilate too. Now two more reasons for his innocence comes up in Matthew 27, verse 18 and 19. For he knew that because of envy they had delivered him up. And while sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Pilate knew, number one, that Jesus' enemies did it because of envy. And number two, the warning of the dream, which is an omen to him. So Pilate attempts to release Jesus by appealing to a Jewish custom that during the Passover, a prisoner is released. Now, we don't know the origin of the custom, but being that it's connected with the Passover, perhaps... As Israel was delivered from its bondage in Egypt, they would free one from prison. Now, Pilate is going to narrow the choices down between two men. Barabbas, a notorious robber, murderer, and rebel that participated in an insurrection at Jerusalem. Now, Pilate wants to release Jesus. So the reasons for selecting Barabbas were you have to have this contrast between an extreme evil Barabbas and an extremely good Jesus. And if you're ignorant enough to choose Barabbas, a known political enemy of the empire, you foolish Jews are asking for trouble from Rome. There is no brainer as to who should be let go. Yet, the Jewish leadership has been working the crowd. But the chief uh, priests, they stirred up the multitude to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Mark 15, verse 11. So Pilate's approach failed due to the persuasive power of the ungodly priest. Matthew 15, verse 12 to 14. Pilate was saying to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate was saying to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. Matthew 15, Matthew, verse 15. And wishing to satisfy the multitude, Pilate re uh, released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged. To have Jesus scourged was Pilate's third attempt to release Jesus by saying, Behold the man, John 19, verse 5. From Pilate's point of view, to show the bloody scourged body of Jesus, the man standing there, was to arouse sympathy and compassion of the people to spare Jesus the cross. However, from the Bible's point of view, it was to fulfill prophecy. Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 5. And by his scourging, we are healed. In the New Testament, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. By his wounds, you were healed. The instrument used in the scourging was called a flagellum. It is a Latin word. And it has a heavy wooden handle and long strips of leather, leather weighed down at the ends with bits of pieces of bone and or metal. Now the number of stripes could be no more than 40 according to the Jewish law in Deuteronomy chapter 25, so they would not want to break the law by a miscount. The Jews limited it to 39 stripes, putting 13 on the chest and 26 on the back. The Romans did not have a limit as to how many or where they could strike. And Jesus was scourged by the brutal Romans. Many died as a result of being bit, uh, beaten with this merciless whip. In John 19, verse 20, as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, 
You are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Now that struck Pilate where he lived. Pilate was in a dilemma between a rock and a hard place. His conscience was struggling. Unwilling to condemn this innocent Nazarene carpenter, but feared to offend the Jewish mob being aroused by their evil leaders and also did, want, did not want to appear to be disloyal to Caesar. Lacking moral courage, Pilate washes his hands as if that gesture is going to make him guiltless. He delivered him over to be crucified. Mark 15, verse 15. In the interval, the Roman soldiers added to the scourging their own mockery, arraying Jesus with a scarlet robe, thrusting a reed as a scepter into his hand, and pressing sharp pointed wreath of thorns upon his head as a crown for this ridiculous looking king of the Jews. So ends this sixfold trial in treachery and hypocrisy and cowardness and selfish policy and savage brutality stand in everlasting exact opposite with the supreme blameless manhood of Jesus. Even there, and then arrayed in mock royalty, facing the jeers and the insults of the mob, Jesus was a thousand times more a king than anyone who ever sat on the throne of Herod or wore the crown of a Caesar. We now close with the most colossal evil ever penetrated by humankind, the crucifixion of our created God, our creator God. The hour and the place. It was before nine in the morning when the order to crucify was given. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his blood, suffered outside the gate. Hebrews 13, verse 12. Now, outside the city of Jerusalem, at a spot called in Hebrew, Galbatha, in the Greek, Cranium, in Latin, Kavira, or Calvary, in each of these three major languages, the meaning is place of the skull. Now on the way to the place of the skull, Jesus went forth bearing his own cross. But before reaching the place of his execution, the Roman guards seize a man from Cyrene and lay the cross on him, perhaps because the weight was just too much for Jesus' strength, exhausted by his sleepless night and the early morning sufferings. Matthew 23, verse 27. And there were following him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. The humble lips of Jesus so long sighted through all of the insults hurled at him now broke forth in pity but not for himself but for them in verse 28 but Jesus turning to them said daughters of Jerusalem stop weeping for me but weep for yourselves and for your children Jesus was referring to the coming complete destruction of Jerusalem within that generation of A.D. 70. At the cross, two ro uh, robbers were crucified with him, one on each side. Crucifixion was the Roman mode of capital punishment for the lowest and the vile common criminals. Out of sympathy, a stupefying drink Wine that was mixed with myrrh was given for such occasions. It was offered to Jesus, but he did not take it. The Lamb of God refused to cloud his faculties, even to ease his agony, as he was there to bear the pain, the sins of the whole world. The leaders of the Jew and Gentile nations that brought him to this hour caused the chief priests 
scribes, and the rulers near the cross to join in the jeers of the rabble. Ha! You have going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. He saved others. He himself, he cannot save. Come down from the cross so that we can see and believe. He's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus was getting this abuse from all around below. But he was also getting it at ear level on both sides of him by the robbers that were pinned on their own crosses too. During the six hours on the cross, the first three were the normal light of the day. And the last three with a special darkness unknown before and since, such as an outer black darkness of hell. During those six hours, Jesus will render seven solemn statements from that center cross. First one recorded in time, perhaps shortly after being suspended between heaven and earth as the soldiers divided up his garments for, by gambling. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Luke 23, 34. The second statement was to his biological mother of his flesh and his cousin John. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his household. John 19, verse 26 and 27. Now one of the two thieves has a turn of heart. And he asked Jesus to remember him when he comes in his kingdom. The third statement is addressed to the sinner that repented. Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. In three hours, Jesus gave three sayings to people around him. He was addressing this too. Now, we have the three hours of strange darkness and of the silence as Jesus is suffering the pains of hell in which Jesus turns his attention to himself and to his father in the last four statements. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Not only did Jesus experience the torment of hell, but the worst agony for him was being separated from the father. As the Father has abandoned, has forsaken Jesus as he was the sin offering. Only those that go to hell will fully realize the meaning of this most serious, sober statement of not being in God's presence. Swiftly there follows the remaining utterances. I am thirsty, John 19, 28. The first and the last expression of bodily or physical pain. Hearts can be hardened by, be, by being a Roman soldier because these fellows were just trained killing machines. Yet they witnessed the pure character of Jesus enduring his six hours of this endurance and his way he responded and he was behaving and acting in every situation. They brought some sour wine up to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. John 19, 30. Finished does not mean ending. The noblest life that ever lived on earth finished the work of human redemption finished or fulfilled what the patriarchs and the prophets had only dreamed. The types and the symbols and the prophecy of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. <clears throat> Number seven statement. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Luke 23, 46. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John 19, verse 30. At the moment of our Lord's expiring cry, 
the land felt the shock of an earthquake. The Jewish temple veil was torn from top heaven to the bottom earth. For Jesus' death marked the termination of God's old covenant for the Jews, having nailed it to the cross. Colossians 2, 14. Now people were filled with fear. Matthew 27, 54. Now the centurion who was standing right in front of him and those who were with him guarding over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of Man. Matthew 26, verse 54, and Mark 15, verse 39. Following the crucifixion, at 6 p.m., 6 p.m., began the high Sabbath, because this was the Passover day. Now, the Jews could commit cold-blooded murder of an innocent man, but they could not be ceremonially defile the Sabbath. What ungodly hypocrisy being expressed among the Jewish council, the highest in the land. Yet we are witnessing moral hypocrisy coming from our swamp in D.C. today. Premeditated murder of our human unborn is fashionable, but you can be penalized if you hurt the dolphins or the sea turtles. The bodies must not remain on the cross after sunset or you defile the Sabbath. So to hasten death, the legs were broken. But Jesus was already dead as shown by the soldier thrusting his spear into Christ's side instead. Now two prophecies out of Psalms 22 and 34 were unconsciously being fulfilled during these events. Jesus' body was given to two disciples, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Loving hands prepared it for burial in Joseph's new tomb. And at the urgent request of yet a very fearful, evil Jewish leadership, the Roman seal and a Roman guard makes the sepulcher secure so that the dead body of the deceiver remains in the tomb. But little did they know that Sunday was coming. As Jesus arose from the dead Sunday morning, so can you this morning. In Romans 6, verse 3 to 5, all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death, buried with him through baptism into death. So as Christ was raised from the dead, in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Upon repentance, you can be raised from the watery grave of immersion to walk in the newness of life as a child of God. So why not come now and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins as they did in New Testament times we not come right now as together we stand and as we